All right, so this is session four for uh, the uh, HBIG 1302 course. All right, so we're doing integrating sources, citation, diving sources, and the final exam overview. Okay, uh, we are going to go through these pretty quick so that we can get some questions in uh, if you have them. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so starting with integration of research. All right, once the writing process starts in earnest on the first draft, it becomes important to decide how research information is utilized, okay? How are you going to, how are you going to be using that information? Uh, there's a few elements that you have that will influence your use of the research. Uh, one of them is whether it's for informational use. Uh, that is, if you're integrating data and information without a stance, or if it's persuasive use. If you have information agreeing with the writer's stance, or information that contradicts the writer's stance. Depending on how you want to use it, uh, if the information agrees with you, you probably go want that as support for your argument. If it's information that contradicts you, you go want that information as part of your refu refutation. Ultimately, it's going to be your own argument, which dictates how research information will be used in the final product. All right. Now, how you actually use it in the text depends on how whether you want to use summary, paraphrase, or quotations. Each banner of integrated information has its own time and place. Uh, you must cite your information, though. Anything that you use that you didn't personally collect has to be cited. All right, starting looking at summary. Uh, how do you do a summary? You condense the argument by keeping the main ideas intact. Uh, when do you use this? You use it when the source's whole argument is relevant, uh, when you have to look at the entire thing holistically. Use it when the source's view is an alternative or opposite one to yours. If it's something that agrees with you but doesn't quite reach the conclusion the same way, or if it's a opposing viewpoint. Also use it when the source's argument supports yours. If it supports yours directly, you can summarize to show that you have these, uh, these particular sources that are in agreement with you. Uh, then we have paraphrase. using. When you use paraphrase, you're re reproducing an idea from a source but translating the information into your own words. This is when you're using something decidedly less than an entire article. If you're looking at using individual facts. Uh, use this when you want to incorporate factual information or one specific idea from a source. Uh, when the source passage is too complex or technical, uh, in this case, you're going to be trying to boil it down into terms that your reader is going to understand. Uh, use it when you want to integrate the source's information without breaking the flow of your writing. So that means using your own language. Okay. The important thing with paraphrasing is it has to be in your own words. Uh, short quotation, uh, working brief quotes from the source smoothly into the grammar of your own sentences. Uh, use this when you need uh, testimony from an authority and you want to have it from the, directly from the horse's mouth. Uh, use this when you want to reproduce the source's voice in a summary. Okay. You also use it when the source language is memorable. If, it's a, if they say something that is really sticking with you and you know it's going to stick with your audience, you may want to uh, quote them on that. Then you finally have long low quotation, you, where you create a block quote offset from the rest of the text to show that it's a quotation. Okay. Uh, when you want to use this is when you intend to analyze or criticize the quotation. You, in which case you're following the quote with your analysis. Or you can also use it when the flavor and language of testimony is important. If we need more of the context of where that quote came from, then this is going to be a good time for you to use a block quote. All right. You're writing a summary. Be as concise as possible to prevent distraction from your own argument. A summary can be as short as a sentence. Okay. Uh, this is actually in context of assignment that you, okay, uh, you're going to need to write a paragraph, okay, uh, as a summary for each source that you use in that project. Uh, when you're writing a paraphrase, uh, big thing is that you have to rewrite the passage into your own words using your own style. Avoid any wordings that sound too similar or exactly like the original source. There's too many instances I've seen where people think they're paraphrasing a work and what they're actually doing is handing the uh, 
handing the paper to a thesaurus and having it puke it back up with different wordings. Okay, so we don't want that happening. We want you to be actually using your own language uh, to sh give us what that previous author said. Avoid patch writing, slipping in unchanged passages from the original. This is technically plagiarism, so you definitely want to avoid that. Also, try writing the paraphrase twice to avoid patch writing and fully integrate the information into your own voice. It's a good point to use your journal, okay? Journals will come in handy for uh, avoiding patch writing, avoiding any kind of plagiarism when it comes to uh, paraphrasing. Uh, let's talk about quoting. There's several accepting grammatical techniques for quoting, okay? Uh, first off, when you're quoting complete sentences, you include a signal tag to show who is being quoted. Okay, that's important. We want to know who the speaker is. Okay, and let me emphasize here, uh, when you're quoting stuff from articles, do not credit it to the title of the article, credit it to the name of the author. Okay, articles do not write themselves. So when you're giving proper credit, you're giving proper credit to the author, not the article. Okay. Uh, cite the page number, if possible, after the quote in parentheses, okay? If you can. If it's not an article that has pagination, then don't worry about that. And citation goes outside the end quote, and end punctuation goes after the citation, if you're using parenthetical citations. Uh, we'll talk about that later, okay? But parenthetical citations go outside of quotation marks, and then the end punctuation for the quote goes after the citation. When you're quoting words and phrases, insert the words or phrases into the sentence using proper grammatical rules. Do not separate the quote with commas because all that's going to do is create a break where you don't want it, okay? Uh, if you're quoting individual words or an individual like three or four word phrase, uh, you don't have to use a comma to separate from the rest of the text, okay? It's technically considered part of that text. Cite the page number at the end of the sentence containing the quotes, okay? So wherever you got that quote from, you're going to cite it at the end of what the, whatever sentence it, that contains it. Uh, you may have to modify quotation to fit with grammar and the flow of your writing. Okay, uh, If you need to modify something, you can insert the changes in brackets. There's two primary times that this is used. One is for clarifying pronouns, where you have to identify who a pronoun is to uh, shift tense that the rest of the uh, writing is in. If you're omitting something from a quoted passage, the generally accepted technique is to use an ellipsis to indicate information that has been omitted. Okay. Uh, typically, it's going to be by itself. More modern works use an ellipsis in brackets. However, however way you want to do it is acceptable. Uh, if you have a quote containing quota uh, quotation, use standard quotation marks for the main quotation, and then use single mark quotation marks for the quote within a quote. And if you're going to do block quotes, uh, again, you use this for quotes that will take up four or more lines in your own essay. Uh, if it's three lines or less, you don't need a block quote. Four lines or more, you will need a block quote. Uh, indent the block quote or on one tab space further than your regular paragraphs, okay? Now, some textbooks show using an indent on the first line, for, uh, above and beyond that uh, indent that you're using to separate the block quote. Uh, Yagelsky is one of these. I say you don't need that. Most block quotes do not indent the first line further than the rest of the quote. Okay. Moving on. Uh, Talk about attri attributing sources. Uh, use attributive tags to show sources of research information. These are easier to do with quotations than with other forms of research integration. Okay, uh, you're trying to show where you're getting the information from. Uh, this is typically achieved with signal phrases, where you insert saying something that says or says this. Okay, and we're crediting the author, not the article. Okay. Only ones that get credit for writing articles because articles do not write themselves. Okay. The author's name can be included in parenthetical citations, which is the MLA standard. Okay. Uh, use attributive tags to show where a serial begins and ends. 
So single data as often as necessary. Sometimes as often as the start of each set in the research in use, use attributed to frame the source material in a rhetorical sense. This shows evaluation of the source to enhance the reader's critical reading. Okay. So your reader knows getting those facts from and they can double check against your source to see how you're integrating the source or are you integrating that fact if it's remaining in context in the context that the original thing used. So let's talk about avoiding plagiarism and academic fraud. Okay. This is a pertinent problem not only in academia but in the professional world as well. So it's going to be up to you to prevent yourself falling into the traps, okay? This is a big thing, and I, in the video lecture, I give you the story of Kavya Nathan. Uh, Ms. Wen, she's, is, see, there's a, I don't know exactly how you pronounce her name. You know, to me, it's pronounced Ms. Wen Nathan, but other people pronounce it Ms. Wen Nathan, okay? Uh, it shows how someone can be affected by plagiarism in the real world, okay? Uh, most plagiarism occurs unwittingly. That is, that people, most people don't intend to play uh, what they're actually just trying to do is get through the assignment uh, and not trying to, uh, not intentionally trying to plagiarize anything. Uh, most of the time this comes from past copy directly from sources without any information of being quoted. This happens a lot in essays in my classes. Right? This also comes from patch writing. Uh, we talked about writing before in of uh, paraphrasing. It also comes from failure to indicate the source of ideas or data created into their own words. Okay? Uh, a lot of people think, okay, I've, I've got information here, it included quotes, so, that, so I don't know if I should say not there, I'm not, I'm not going to cite it. Okay? That is really plagiarism. Cite anything you did not generate yourself. Less often do you see people in kind of plagiarism, which would follow category of fraud. This is things such as turning a paper mill essay, uh, where you purchase from a paper mill online uh, based on the topic and then turn it in. Uh, essays that copy another student's essays. Okay? Uh, essays that copy chunks of text from sources without attribution. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is like uh, copy-paste copy -paste plagiarism copying directly from the source and putting it into your uh, work and advertising it as your own. Uh, there's also the issue of fabricating data, okay? If you made up data for your, for your uh, uh, work, that's considered to be conscious, that's considered to be academic fraud, okay? Or for some ways that you can avoid plagiarism. At the start of your class, read the class policy on plagiarism. Okay, and uh, what kind of uh, what kind of policy does your professor have? What kind of policy does your instructor have for uh, if they receive plagiarism or not? I was straightforward with mine. Uh, I don't have to be because the self does not have a policy. Okay, uh, they leave it up to them to do it. So that's why I'm pretty clear on mine. Uh, they also pose a research question rather than a topic area when you're starting off with essays. This prevents you from being able to just run a search and find a paper. Okay? Uh, what this actually makes you do is try to think about what the topic should be and how you're going to uh, address it. Okay? When you're at the note taking stage, one thing you do is create bibliographical, bibliographic entry for each source so that you make sure that you're citing properly. Copy packages into your journal word for word and quotation rather than photocopying them, okay? Because that is an invitation to just uh, copy it directly into your paper, all right? Uh, if you write it out and include the quotation marks, then you can show that it is a quote and you have to make sure that you're attributing to the right source. Avoid patch writing and summaries or paraphrases, okay? Don't uh, lift individual phrases from uh, any works that you are using for research. Uh, distinguish informational notes from personal exploratory notes, okay? Uh, make sure that you have a divider between 
what the essay says and what you are evaluating the uh, what you're evaluating the source is saying. Okay. Uh, as you're writing the draft, uh, first off, uh, one way that you can definitely avoid plagiarism is by writing in your own words. Now, the sole exception for this is quotations. Okay. But for the most part, you should be writing in language that sounds like the way you speak. Uh, indicate all quotations properly. Give them signal phrases. Give them citations. Mark them as quotations. Okay. Avoid patch writing and summarizing or paraphrasing. We talked about that previously. Never cut and paste website passages directly into a draft. Okay. That is a red flag, especially because most times you can't erase formatting. Uh, use attributive tags and parenthetical citations within your paper, uh, whether you're quoting something or just using information that that source gave you. Uh, cite all quotations, paraphrases, summaries, and any other references to other sources. Okay. Use in-text citations for all visuals. Okay. People sometimes forget about this as well. Uh, you need to cite where you've gotten any visual aids that you may be using, any charts, photographs, anything like that, as long as you are not the one that generated it yourself. Uh, use in-text citations for all ideas and facts that are not common knowledge. Okay. So anything that is considered to be academic com common knowledge does not need to be cited, uh, but everything else does. So. Uh, just a general reminder of what needs citation, okay? Writers question all the time what cit when citations are necessary in context with their work. As a general rule of thumb, any information that is not, again, academic common knowledge should be cited. So this includes any quotation, any paraphrased passage, any summarized passage or otherwise referred to passage, any image, diagram, chart, or table if you did not generate it yourself, any sound or video file used in a multimedia project, and any idea, concept, or fact found from a source, again, that is not common knowledge. And I believe uh, what I included as common knowledge includes significant things, significant documents such as, a uh, uh, good example of this is U.S. Constitution or Declaration of Independence. Those are considered to be academic con common knowledge, uh, so they usually do not need citation. <clears throat> Citations are intended to work directly with works cited pages in formal academic essays. They give the reader a quick reference to the source, which can be used as a roadmap of sorts to the works cited page. So it is important that your works cited and your citations match up. Okay? The works cited page is directly referenced from the, by the citations. The information from the citations, which is obviously found in works cited listings such as author names, Possibly shorten titles for sources if they did not have an author or if the author wrote multiple uh, works that you're using. Uh, and page numbers. Where in the uh, works can that source be found? Uh, as a quick reference, the textbook packages that they're supposed to sell to you guys include a guide to the most recent MLA style standards. Uh, the best reference, though, that I found is the Purdue OWL site, which is their online writing lab. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go there because I because it's going to take too long to go through. Uh, you definitely want to check this out on your own. Uh, I believe next week we're actually going to be looking at it in detail in the video lectures. MLA formatting rules include not only works cited pages and citations, but also General layout standards for essays, such as spacing, pagination, author identification, and so on. So it's thoroughly useful to a collegiate writer. Okay, absolutely, 100% bookmark this. Okay, this is probably one of your best resources for composition in college. All right, as long as everybody's with, as long as you're with me so far, let's go ahead and move on uh, and talk about reliability sources. So once you've performed research on your topic, you need to go through your resources and evaluate them for use in your essay. This also ties into the antibiography of the biography because part of your annotation is going to be assessing the source to see if it's useful to you. Okay? Sources have to be evaluated in a critical manner looking for anything that might disqualify them or call their reliability into question. Okay? Many times, evaluating a resource is more than just confirming the facts presented are correct. 
This process also involves evaluating how the facts are presented, the context of the presentation, and the tone the original author gives to the presentation of the facts. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I look at a way of re reading your sources rhetorically. How do you evaluate a mountain of research and narrow it down to something more reasonable? Well, first thing, read the sources with your own goals in mind. That is, focus on the information that will directly help or hurt your own essay's argument. Okay, anything in there that's going to directly hurt, harm, or help you. Okay, think of the focus of your questions. In your early research, you could you'd probably be looking at overviews, uh, abstracts, which are more useful to give you a handle on the subject. And I'll give you an idea of what sources you might be able to use. Further on down the line with further research, you want to analyze how others are using information, uh, the practical uses for that information, and to keep an open mind to new ideas that may be presented to you. Okay. As you're doing further research, you're also looking at uh, what, how, how authors are using the same information and what kind of spin they're taking on them. Read the sources in a rhetorical manner. Evaluate the sources based on questioning their source. The big key to reading in a rhetorical manner is to always read like a skeptic. Okay, uh, read it like you are not taking anything at face value. To uh, quote Ronald Reagan, "Trust but verify." Okay. Uh, make sure that your source is using good facts. Make sure that your source is reliable. All right, so here's some things to think about when you're uh, reading critically and rhetorically. Who is the author? What kind of credentials, affiliations, and educational background do they have? Okay, some place you can look for credentials is at the end of, an, end of a print article. Uh, you can run a Google search for the author. You can look for the author's other works. Uh, sources genre determines who the intended audience was, okay? So look for the original publication information where it showed up initially, and look for other articles in from those works if it's periodical. Uh, especially, you want to see what other stuff that same publication has been uh, giving an audience to. What is the author's purpose? How is the author attempting to shape the audience's views, okay? What kind of uh, legwork are they doing in trying to show you what they mean? Is the piece expressive, informational, analytical, or persuasive? Okay. Uh, who sponsored the site it came from? Who is the, uh, who is the publisher? Who is uh, the one directly profiting from it? What is the publication's reputation? What kind of stuff have they done in the past? Uh, what are they known for? What is the author's angle or bias? So what data and information does the author cite? Are they using particularly biased sources or are they using impartial ones? What are the author's underlying values, assumptions, and beliefs? Can you tell uh, what they feel, uh, what their opinions are, what their beliefs are, what their morals are uh, based on their writing? What are they not telling you? Because sometimes what's not included is uh, just as important as what is included in determining an author's biases. So, as you're reading and, take, and doing rhetorical reading, you want to take purposeful notes. So, uh, any students doing your initial research will simply photocopy sources, which is a very bad idea. It leads to regurgitation rather than original ideas. Okay? So, to take purposeful notes, this is what Gigelsky recommends. He recommends dividing your notepad or your pages in your notebook up into three columns. Okay? Column one. It's going to be your bibliographical information. So it's the article name, the author name, publication, the date, the publisher, everything you need uh, to create a works cited listing at source. Middle column is the informational notes on the source, where it came from, what other materials present in the same issue, quotations from the source. Third column, though, is your exploratory notes. That is your self-evaluation of the value of the source. Uh, you're questioning the sources, questions that the source has raised and ideas about how the source's information fits in with your thesis, okay? So this is where you're evaluating the sources, okay? We get to functions for sources. Uh, some things that you may use them for, one is background information to present the greater context for your uh, argument to give the perspective. Uh, you may be using source for al an alternative view 
which may either be counter to your thesis, in which case you're summarizing it and responding to it, or it could be agreeing with your thesis, but it's and from a different direction, in which case you might want to mention it briefly and talk about how they reach that same conclusion in a different way. Uh, you use it for information or testimony. Use it as evidence for your own thesis, okay? Uh, conversely, you could also use it if it's counter to your position because uh, it's going to be useful for your opposition, so you're going to need to address it, okay? Uh, the last one is theory or method to influence the approach. So if you're using a research source to inform how you're actually going to approach the topic, okay, that also counts in this. All right. So let's talk about reliability. How accurate is the source against other sources reporting the same or similar facts? Okay, are they giving you the same information? Uh, or are they putting a weird uh, spin on things? Are facts distorted to serve the author's own agenda? Okay. Is the manipulation of facts acknowledged by the author? Okay. Uh, it can actually be to an author's credit if they acknowledge how uh, facts can be manipulated or massaged to uh, reach their conclusion, uh, as long as they can prove that they're not doing that. Okay. Have the facts been checked by an independent source? Can you double check with some somebody like Snopes, PolitiFact, uh, so sources like that, which can fact check this stuff and make sure that they're on the up and up, okay? Uh, this more applies to web sources than anything else, but how well edited is the source, okay? Uh, how much time and care have they taken into uh, revision and then proofreading and editing, okay? Uh, if it's a self-published, if it's a self-published book, you gonna have be slightly less reputable than a newspaper hosted blog. Let's get into that issue of credibility. Okay, credibility is internal factors as opposed to external factors for reliability. So this comes down to how much do you trust the author? Okay, do you feel like it's somebody that you can believe in? Are they an expert in the field? Is it somebody who's a trustworthy observer who may have firsthand uh, experience with the topic that you're dealing with, okay? Is it a popular author? Is it a not so popular author? Uh, all sorts of factors can lead to uh, trust or distrust of an author, okay? Uh, writers earn their credibility through moral courage, integrity, and consistency of principle. That gets us the angle of vision. This is your viewpoint that, you're, that the source's author is taking. How does the author's underlying values, assumptions, or beliefs share the, shape the argument as it is presented? Okay. How do you determine this? First off, research the author. Find out what, find out all you can about the author, such as their politics, their education, their upbringing, their reputation, uh, anything that might influence their character and influence their trustworthiness. Okay. Uh, do your research. Also research the genre, okay? Uh, evaluate the audience. Who are, who are they trying to write for? Who is the intended target audience for the work? Uh, look at the market niche. What corner of the market does the publication exist for, okay? What are they trying to do? Uh, also political reputation of the publication. What have they, what side of the political spectrum have they worked with in the past, okay? A base knowledge of the political spectrum and how authors, publishers, and websites fall in the chart is useful in the evaluation of sources, okay? Uh, I can't overstate that, okay? You want to know where they are coming from in terms of right-wing, left-wing, that sort of thing. Obvious bias toward one end of the spectrum or the other can lead to coloring of facts to suit their politics, may render those facts unusable for the sake of a persuasive essay, okay? Keep that in mind. They may be 100% factual, but the way that they present those facts may leave their uh, work to be unreliable. Uh, we do have the uh, uh, charts that I showed you in the slides, uh, the Vanessa Otero media bias and media quality charts, okay? Uh, in the slideshow, this is uh, version 3.0. Uh, the most recent version, it says 6.0. It's actually 7.0 they're up to now. Uh, and in fact, I show you 7.0 in the uh, video lecture, okay? Remember, this is the chart that shows you from left to right, gives you the political leanings, and from top to bottom gives you trustworthiness, where top is the most trustworthy 
and the bottom is the BS artist. Okay. Uh, degree of advocacy is another thing to keep in mind. How obviously does the author take a stance in the source? Okay. Uh, this comes down to a few things. First off, objective versus persuasive writing. Does the author have skin in the game? Are they going to be directly affected by the argument and its conclusion? Or are they just a mere observer who is looking at what's going to happen and saying, oh, that's going to be bad for them. That's going to be bad for them. That's going to be bad for them. Okay. Uh, do they have membership in an advocacy organization such as the NRA, Sierra Club, uh, John Birch Society, Audubon Society, so on and so forth? Okay. Does the author hold a grudge? People don't really think about this, but sometimes authors can hold uh, things against their subjects, and in that case, they'll start writing negative stuff about them just to hurt them. Okay. In this case, interpretation of data can be called into question if you know the author holds a grudge against whatever it is they're writing about. Keep in mind also neutrality will usually provide better resources. So the more neutral an author is, the more factual they're going to write about. Okay. Social media also tends to be a minefield of opinion, so be cautious about using sources shared from sites like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, so on and so forth. Trolling efforts tend to center on social media. It's vital to be able to determine fake accounts that may not be trustworthy. For that purpose, in the video lecture, we go through the uh, quiz spotthetroll.org from uh, Clemson University to train you to spot professional trolling. Okay. Uh, finally, let's talk about evaluating web sources. Uh, web sources can be a wonderful in that they are convenient to find and easy to use, but Again, they can be a minefield of opinionated articles and urban myths, okay? Valuing web sources is similar to how you evaluate print sources. Critical reading and research into sites will help evaluate, okay? So what are we evaluating? The authority, who is the page sponsor? Are the author credentials identified? Is the sponsor's motivation clearly stated from the home page? Do they have contact information? Look at objectivity. Is there a clear purpose to the site? Is there, does the site have explicit point of view? Are the author's affiliations listed or is the audience identified? Uh, look at coverage. What topics are included on the site? Is it a suitable depth of coverage and is evidence presented that can be proven from a third party? Accuracy. Are sources, are they telling you where they're getting this stuff from? Do facts appear accurate? Okay. Is it independently verifiable? And then finally, currency. When was the last site update? Okay. Uh, when was the article uploaded? Is the information current or relevant at the present? All right. One other thing to look at for valuing web sources is the domain identifiers. Okay. They are key in determining credibility of web sources. Okay. Uh, or one of the keys. All right. Uh, just as a general guideline here, some of the more common ones you find out there, .com are commercial sites which promote business or marketing services. They're typically no identified authors. Most times .coms are only reliable if you are looking for something directly from that company. The only exception to this is most major newspaper sites are .coms. Then we have .org, which is a nonprofit organization or advocacy group. Some of them are neutral, but most of them will have a distinct angle of vision, okay? So .orgs, depending on who it is, may or may not be trustworthy. We have .edu. These are college and university sites, which typically include institutional information, as well as scholarly and advocacy links, okay? They're usually accurate. Then we have .gov and .mil, which are government agencies and military units. These include a wide range of data and support for policy. Generally, they are accepted to be uh, reliable sources. Evaluate your own purpose for using the web source as well to help in the evaluation process of your sources. Okay, so why do you want to use that? What is the purpose of you using that web source? Okay, does your purpose call for a more objective view or does it call for an advocate? Okay, all things you need to consider now. Uh, we'll get to the anti-bibliography here, and then the last part of this is the final exam review, okay? 
so this is the next assignment coming up. As a team, you're going to be coordinating with each other to construct an annotated bibliography of the types usually called for in post-grad work. Okay? Uh, annotated bibs, bibliographies are useful for writers because they provide a brief summary of the research source and its use within the paper in question. All right? So uh, you're basically going to be using an annotated bibliography to evaluate sources. Uh, I'm checking one thing here real quick. We'll be right back. Let's see. No, that's I'm in the wrong section. That's a problem. All right, give me a second. There we go. All right. There it is. Okay. So uh Due date on this one on the antibiography is April 30th. Okay, just so we're just so we're clear on that. So, continuing on with antibiography, uh, the annotations under each listing also give an evaluation based on the author's needs as to how reliable or useful a source is. Uh, your team is going to create a resource list. Okay, that's the only thing the team is going to do for this. Okay, each individual member of the group will be responsible for writing their own copy of the annotated bibliography. Each member of the group is also going to be responsible for submitting two, at least two articles, uh, two sources to the group uh, for everybody to use for their annotated bibliographies. Uh, here's the way it's generally going to work. Okay, you're going to choose a general topic from current events in the news and collaborate on finding resources on that topic. It's going to require your group to come up with, well, it says your group needs to come up with a research question. Please disregard that. What this actually should say is that you need to come up with your own research question to focus your research search, source search, okay? So you need to come up with your own research question. You're going to supply the uh, uh, two or three uh, sources that will support that research question. Uh, it will be up to the uh, rest of the team to determine whether your sources will help them as well. Okay? Collaboration is required for this assignment to work. Utilize the discussion board to coordinate during the week with the rest of your team. If you have contact with your teammates outside of eCampus, collaborate there as well. Okay? Now, the formatting requirements for this uh, for this bibliography. Uh, it should be MLA format for bibliographical information. Uh, we're going to go through Purdue OWL next week to, so you can see what that is. Okay. Um, check out one other thing here. No, I didn't give it to you. I'm going to have to put it, put it up for you. All right. Uh, alphabetical order for the listings based on the beginning of each listing. Follow MLA protocol for multiple sources from the same author. Uh, then you'll need 11 to 12 point font, Times New Roman, Arial Calibri, double spaced, hanging indents used for the bibliographical listings, no indents for the annotations. Uh, if you're questioning hanging indents, uh, Purdue Owl shows you, shows you those. Uh, I will show you those next week as well. Again, the assignment is due April 30th. Okay. The other thing is, is that there is going to, this assignment is also going to act as the research basis for the proposal argument essay. Okay. So as you gather your research sources and creating your research question, focus your attention toward making a proposal for change. Okay? This is going to be the easiest way to do this. All right? Uh, I will, uh, in the next week, post a sample annotated bib to the uh, to eCampus under the <coughs> excuse me, under the link for uh, the PowerPoints and YouTube lectures. So you guys will have a sample that you can uh, use the model. All right. So next up, the final exam materials. Okay. Uh, final exam materials are currently available on eCampus under the exam tab. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a timed writing assignment. You will need to secure a proctor to administer the exam for you. They will act as a timekeeper. Definition of a proctor is a responsible adult within your household. Okay. Uh, basically, they're going to be watching and timing you so that you do not cheat and you do not exceed the time limit. Now, there is an exam packet on eCampus. It will give you most of the necessary materials for the exam, as well as a list of four possible questions that may appear. Okay. The idea of this exam is that you're going to write a response, a strong response argument essay 
uh, based on whichever one of the questions that you choose out of the ones that you're offered. Okay. It is highly suggested that you perform some further research into the materials presented, especially if some of it is unfamiliar to you. It is also highly suggested that you print out the packet. You're allowed to use the packet in the exam along with any additional material written for into it. Okay, notes are acceptable for use as long as they're written into a hard copy of the exam packet. And with that in mind, the uh, rest of this is going to be going over the exam topic, uh, which is children's television censorship. Okay? Always under intense scrutiny, children's television can sometimes veer into areas where general read adult audiences become more uncomfortable with subject matter. Reaction to these ventures into the wilderness can vary on a local or national scale, but many times when the ire of the adults thinking of the children is raised, it leads to the censorship or wholesale change to individual episodes or even entire series. No usual suspects here when it comes to what causes controversy or what shows it appears on. Main commonality is that something angers a potentially powerful membership of the audience and leads to banning of episodes, cutting of scenes, or in some cases changing characters. So the issues is causing the controversy change over time. Ranging from issues with violent content and overtly offensive behavior to uncomfortable social movements and uncomfortable societal ills. Okay? Uh, real quick, because we're running low on time here, let's go through the rest of these slides. Uh, basically, section by section in the packet. Reason, the main reasons that you find for controversy typically uh, fall into these categories. One is violence. Uh, you have offensive content and language, physical harm to viewers, excessive death portrayals, offensive religious content, overt sexual content, uh, and promoting antisocial behavior. Uh, those are typically the uh, things that will guarantee you your episode is going to get banned. Okay. The case study, the first case study is Deadly Force, an episode of Gargoyles, uh, which centers about around gun safety uh, and involves one of the main characters accidentally getting shot. Uh, in the original broadcast, the uh, shooting was, uh, you saw the gun go off and then you saw the after effects. You didn't see the, uh, you didn't see the uh, character actually get hit, uh, but you saw that she actually was hit. Uh, the consequences were very dire and very realistic. Uh, she, was, sorry, she was almost completely bled out by the time she got to the hospital. Uh, she's uh, unconscious. She's in, in ICU. Uh, she has a cardiac arrest at one point, but then she, eventually she does start recovering. <clears throat> Next episode, she's on crutches uh, to show that she's still feeling the after effects. Okay. Originally, uh, it aired in syndication uh, uncensored. Okay. It was removed from rotation when it appeared on Disney-owned cable networks such as Toon Disney and Disney XD. Uh, other networks that showed the series digitally removed blood from the scene where the character was shot. The character was Elisa Maza. Uh, episode was restored to the series in 2013 for DVD. Uh, in 2019, it was made available on Disney+. Plus. Episode says proper place in the season, but the scene is recut to avoid showing the gunshot wound. Uh, next case study is Sesame Street. Uh, obviously, the gold standard of American television. Uh, it's in its 50th season. It's earned no shortage of criticism over how issues have been portrayed on the show, uh, most times involving portrayals of social issues such as multiculturalism and societal ills. The uh, show has introduced characters over the years who introduce children to these societal concepts, usually in response to criticisms, and have integrated them into the show's overall storyline. <clears throat> I will note, not only do they do societal ills, they've also uh, generated controversy over people who don't like the inclusionary aspect of it. Uh, people have complained about uh, kids with disabilities showing up on the show. Uh, early in its run was still uh, very, very not, not far removed from the civil rights era. Uh, so the governor of Mississippi actually demanded that PBS stations uh, take the show off the air after a uh, racially motivated uh, campus shooting at the University of Mississippi. Uh, and he felt that, uh, uh, oh my God, this integration stuff has to be the cause for it, okay? So let's get rid of any media that uh, uh, promotes integration. So bye-bye Sesame Street, okay? Uh, 
Next one, LGBTQIA plus representation. Recent years, this is more prevalent as a so topic for controversy, okay? Specifically, portrayals of relationships and characters in media. Much of the censorship surrounding this issue gets enacted in foreign countries when shows are localized. There's precedent for this in the U.S. with Sailor Moon, although it, I do go into more detail about this uh, funny story where they tried to prevent two characters from being lesbian and instead turned them into an incestuous couple. Uh, shows have been developed in recent years that have had LGBTQIA plus representation built into them. Uh, many times as the framework for the entire show is built around, such as Steven Universe or she and the Princesses of Power. While many shows can only get away with it in closing seasons or episodes, more shows recently are being overt about their representation with the support of their broadcast platforms, okay? Especially ones that show up on streaming services such as Netflix, uh, Hulu, Disney+, places like that. Last slide is the extra resources. Uh, going, the exam packet has a number of other resources. One of them is a five-article series from uh, Impact Nottingham uh, about LGBTQIA plus representation, okay? Uh, Twelve video clips are included in there. Uh, most of them are Sesame Street, but some of them are also showing stuff that has caused controversy. Uh, the other shows that are not mentioned in the Looper article or not Sesame Street uh, that I've listed here, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, Steven Universe, on the Princess of Power, Gravity Falls, The Legend of Korra, Adventure Time, and The Owl House. Okay, uh, most of that, in fact, I would actually say almost all of it, is controversy over LGBTQIA+. Okay, that seems to be the main thing that gets people's ire up in recent years. All right, so uh, that does it for the slides. Uh, I give you about five minutes here for questions if you have any. Uh, and then we'll cut you loose. Okay, team, team assignment is basically just uh, the anti-bibliography. You, you need to have a team first off, okay? Uh, I did notice that no, nobody has used that forum yet, so I'm not sure if you guys have made teams or not. Uh, by my count, there's exactly four of you that are participating, so that would actually form one team, okay? Uh, you guys need to uh, agree on a general topic, okay, uh, and do some... Come up with your own research question within that topic that leans toward uh, creating a proposal. And then you're going to need to go do some research within your research question. I come up with about two or three sources that would be useful for you. Okay. Uh, then, you're going to, then you're going to share those with your team and you're going to All right, I apologize for that. I accidentally got disconnected. So we're going to create one big source list, okay? Uh, and your source list is going to be what the basis of your anti-bibliography is. You're going to look through all those sources, and you're going to check them against your research question and decide whether you'll be able to use them or not. And then in the anti-bibliography, you're going to give me your research question. You're going to give me the... Uh, Listing for each source is going to include its bibliographical information, 
and then a paragraph, the summary of the source, and your evaluation of whether it's usable or not. All right, and that's five minutes here, so, uh, okay. My attack, you only need to do, the the only ones you need to do are the ones that are marked in orange that say can, counts toward grade, and they both should all be auto-graded, okay? It's not just in the auto-graded uh, assignments uh, tab. There's also one for uh, critical grammar exercises uh, that, that also has required work that you need to do. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, cut you get, cut you loose here because we're approaching one o'clock. Uh, uh, thanks for coming to this session. I do apologize for the technical problems that we had with it. Uh, and next week we're going to be talking over uh, in in the lectures we'll be talking over uh, Purdue Owl. Uh, we'll be talking over proper MLA formatting for works cited. Uh, and we're going to have another round on the uh, exam stuff. This time it'll be the exam questions uh, overview. All right, I will see you guys then next week. Thanks for coming by.